Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, I'm Miguel Moraru. Thank you for having me here. Uh, this talk is going to be essentially about revisiting Paxos. And I'm going to try to convince you that that's indeed as good as, as, as it sounds, but uh, just not in that way. So the uh, general topic for my thesis work is fault tolerance in distributed systems. And like fault tolerance in any other domain, this is mostly about redundancy. The way we achieve redundancy in distributed systems is through state replication. Uh, the way we do it is we have a process that's replicated on multiple machines. So even if, even if some of these machines fail, the remaining ones will be able to handle client queries and commands just as the failed ones would have. And to keep the states of these processes in sync, what we do is we implement them as uh, state machines. That means they change their internal state only as a result of executing the commands proposed by the clients of the system. And then we make sure that they execute the same commands in the same order. And uh, this technique is called state machine replication. Uh, I'm going to use this uh, shortcut, SMR. Um, and state machine replication is really one of the uh, most important primitives that we have in distributed systems. It is important, uh, for example, in local area clusters, uh, systems such as Chubby, Boxwood, Smarter, Zookeeper, they use state machine replication to implement uh, operations as diverse as replicating data, uh, resource discovery, uh, distributed synchronization. And because we build larger and larger clusters, there is increasing pressure on these implementations of state machine replication to have higher throughput and availability. We also use state machine replication in the wide area because we have databases that are being accessed simultaneously by clients on different continents. We want to bring that data closer to clients and at the same time we want to be able to tolerate full data center outages. And because in this setting, distances are so large, any inefficiency in extra unnecessary message delays or round trips to commit uh, is going to have a high impact on latency. So low latency in this setting is very important. And there are many ways to implement same machine replication. They range from simple primary backup protocols to more complex protocols, such as Paxos and Byzantine fault tolerance. Now, all the systems that I've mentioned in the previous slides, they implement uh, variants of, of Paxos. And the reason is, uh, Paxos is popular because it has uh, apparently the right trade-off between safety, that is what kind of failures it can tolerate, and uh, performance. So what do I mean by performance? Paxos is as fast or faster than primary backup protocols. And because it does not depend on external failure detectors, it has very high availability. Uh, and let me explain what I mean by that by contrasting it with a primary backup system. Let's say we have a primary backup set up and at some point there's a network partition. If we were to let clients talk to both the primary and the backup, their states will diverge. State of the primary will diverge from the state of the backup, which is exactly the opposite of what we want to achieve. So in this situation, what we do is we have this external entity, an external failure detector, that decides which uh, of the two copies uh, has officially failed and chooses the other one as the official uh, authority copy of the data. But of course, it, it, is going to take a, uh, uh, some, it is going to take a time between the primary or the neural partition uh, setting in and the external failure detector choosing the backup to be uh, the new copy of the data. So during that time, the system is going to be unavailable for new commands. Or something that failure detector module yeah it's it's a uh, yeah exactly it's simple failure detector exactly um, now in Paxos by contrast we use more resources we have three replicas instead of two to tolerate one failure but any network partition or any replica appearing to have failed will not cause the remaining majority of replicas to uh, stall they they will be able to continue processing commands and in fact we don't have to declare failure synchronously here we can just continue operating with the majority of the replicas. That means that Paxos and systems like Paxos have uh, almost instant failover, which is to say very high availability. 
And this brings me to the overarching goal of my thesis work. So in my thesis work, I want to improve state machine replication, focusing on Paxos-style state machine replication. That is to say, failures are non-Byzantine, and uh, uh, I focus on protocols that, that uh, use quorum consensus. And I want to improve state machine replication on multiple practically important dimensions, but also in a way that's well anchored in theory. And, and here's what I mean by that. So a Paxos system has essentially two components. There's the Paxos algorithm itself, which is this core, general, uh, nice algorithmic core. And then there are the uh, implementation considerations. How do we choose to implement a certain feature of the algorithm? How do we optimize a certain performance characteristic that's important to our application? And I want to improve state machine replication in a way that also expands this nice algorithmic core to include some of the more uh, practical implementation uh, details. The, the reason why I want to do that is because I want the result to be easily applicable to a wide range of applications. So in this talk, I'm going to present uh, the two components that I've worked on so far uh, to achieving this goal. The first one is a new state machine replication protocol based on Paxos. We call it the egalitarian Paxos. Uh, it achieves lower latency, higher throughput, and better performance stability than previous state machine replication protocols. And the second one is a technique that addresses an orthogonal performance characteristic of state machine replication, which is how fast can we read uh, the state of these replicated state machines. Sorry to be Galterian Paxos, but it is useful to go through a quick Paxos overview first. So Paxos at its core is an agreement protocol used by multiple processes to agree on one thing. It tolerates F failures with two F loss on total replicas, and that's optimal because we don't depend on external failure detectors. Replicas can fail by crashing. Um, the replicas are not, uh, sorry, the failures are non-Byzantine, which is to say that replicas can fail to reply for an indefinite amount of time, but they will not reply in ways that do not conform to the protocol. And finally, communication is asynchronous. So we any assumptions about the synchronicity of communication for the protocol to be safe. To be able to make progress, however, we do rely on there being periods of, of, of synchrony. So how do we use this protocol uh, that it's an agreement, that is an agreement protocol to agree on a sequence of commands that we, we execute? Because remember, that's the goal in say machine replication. And I'm going to show you this through an example. Let's say we have three replicas. This is the uh, replicated state. Every one of these replicas has a copy of this. Uh, but I'm just going to, to show one on this diagram for simplicity. And this is essentially a pre-ordered uh, sequence of slots, of command slots. Uh, they're initially empty. Clients will submit commands to these replicas. And they will contend for these slots by running Paxos. As a result of running Paxos, only one of them will win. And everyone will know which one that was. So everyone will put command B in slot number one. The replicas that lost this slot will choose a different slot. They will contend for a different slot, and so on. After a, a contiguous sequence of slots has been filled, every replica can independently execute the same sequence of commands. Thus, uh, their state will be uh, kept in sync. So uh, the takeaways here are that with Paxos, we choose commands independently for each slot. So there is a separate instantiation of Paxos for each of these uh, pre-ordered slots. And in canonical Paxos, it takes at least two round trips to commit a command. The first one is to take ownership of a slot. And the second one is to actually propose the command. Because of this inefficiency, we would ideally like to, to be able to commit commands after just one round trip. Um, practical systems implement something that's called multi-Paxos. In multi-Paxos, one of the replicas is the pre-established leader over all the slots. And then clients will only talk to this one replica. This one replica, which we call the stable leader, will choose which command goes into each slot. And because it no longer has to take ownership of, of each slot individually, it is the pre-established owner of everything, uh, it can commit commands after just one round trip. That's a good question. It does indeed. So it can be a bottleneck for both performance, because it has to handle more messages for each command than all the other non-leader replicas. And also a bottleneck for availability, because there's a, there's a time between uh, a leader failing 
and the new leader being elected where no one can make progress. Is that just the Paxos state is just establishing a new leader? Is that, is so the, uh, the complicated parts of Paxos come in here when a new leader is elected, yes. So we can actually use any, any uh, uh, protocol we want to, to uh, choose a new leader, but by running Paxos, we are guaranteed to be safe. So we are, we're guaranteed that even if two replicas believe they are leaders at the same time, we are still safe. And that's what Paxos gives us. So. The question that motivated our research is can, can we have it all? Can we have the high throughput and low latency of multi paxos but at the same time keep the uh, nice properties of, of canonical PAXOS, which are constant availability? Can we also distribute load evenly across all replicas instead of having just uh, one, this one stable leader uh, hotspot that can be a bottleneck for performance? At the same time, can we use the fastest replica in the system to commit a command? Uh, for instance, there might be concurrent uh, jobs running on our cluster that might make some of our replicas slower others we would ideally want to be able to avoid those replicas. And finally, can we use the closest replica, the, the uh, geographically cro closest replica, so that we can get low latency in the wide area? And canonical Paxos has all these properties except for high performance. multi Paxos solves that, but it loses the other properties uh, in the process. So egalitarian Paxos by contrast, has all these properties and implements them efficiently so much so that it has higher performance than multi paxos And deep paxos is all about ordering. So we've seen that previous strategies for ordering commands were having replicas contend for slots. This was the case for canonical paxos Having one replica decide, and this was multi paxos but also other variants of paxos called fast paxos and generalized paxos And finally, a newer Paxos variant called Mencius, where replicas take turns in proposing commands. In this setting, it is pre-established that the first replica is the leader of every third slot starting at one, the second replica is the leader of every third slot starting at two, and so on. Mencius is effective at balancing load, and that's because we have many of these commands being proposed at the same time, so every replica will simultaneously uh, have the same functions. So every replica is both a leader and acceptor for some commands. Unfortunately, the problem that Mencius has is that before committing a command, before committing a slot, we have to learn what happened in all the previous slots. And remember, the previous slots belong to uh, every replica in the system. So we have to learn some information from every replica in the system. That makes Mencius run at the speed of the slowest replica and it also means that uh, the system is going to be temporarily unavailable whenever any single replica is temporarily unavailable. To whom does he talk? Uh, the he client. Doesn't know. I mean, he doesn't know what the number of that command is going to be, so he can't do mod three and talk right. to the right one. Right? So it depends on uh, the exact setup. If it's a single cluster setup, the client can just choose arbitrarily at random. If it's a distributed, if it's a geo-replicated setup, the client can choose its closest replica. The one that has the mod three thing, like the correct. No, no, no. So Mencius works um, even if clients choose at random replica. So I can send a command to one replica, and then the next command that's logically connected to my first one to another replica, and it works. So by contrast, in Epaxos, we take a very different approach. Instead of having this linear command slot space, we split it into as many subspaces as there are replicas, and we give default ownership over one subspace to each of the uh, replicas. So imagine the uh, replicated state now is this bidimensional array. Everyone has a copy of this, but only the first replica is allowed to propose commands on the first row. Only the second replica is allowed to propose commands on the second row, and so on. So com uh, clients can now choose any replica to uh, propose commands to, and that replica will uh, lead the uh, commit process in one of the slots that it is the uh, default leader of. And that's good because there's no longer contention for slots. But how exactly do we order these commands, right? Does B come after or before D? So in the process of choosing commands in slots, we also choose what we call ordering constraints. And this says that B has a, an ordering constraint on A, which is to say that command B should follow A. And we do that for every single command. And when we've committed 
uh, a slot, we also commit it with its ordering constraints, and every non-faulty replica will see the same command in the same slot with the exact same ordering constraints. So therefore, all non-faulty replicas can analyze this dependency graph and come up with the exact same ordering decision. And the takeaways here are that with e access, we get load balancing because all replicas are leaders at the same time, command leaders, we call them. And um, very importantly, ePaxos has the flexibility to choose any quorum of replicas to commit a command to. So it's no longer the case that there's one special replica like the stable leader in multi Paxos that has to be on the decision path for every decision, on the critical path for the decision. And there's no longer the case that we have to get some information from every replica in the system. Right? So we have this flexibility to choose just any replicas to commit a command to. Right, now we've got the problem of establishing what these ordering constraints are, and there might be n squared of them, so this might have made it worse. Oh, well, uh, it's not, it, it might be n squared of them, it's not n squared of them, and I, I'm going to show you why. So how exactly do we get these uh, ordering constraints? Uh, this is an example that I'm going to show you. It's a time sequence diagram, time slow from left to right. We have five replicas, and let's assume that at some point command A is proposed at replica one. Now R1 sends a pre-accept for A. Pre-accept is the way we call the first round messages, right? So this pre-accept tells the majority of replica, which is itself, and replicas are two and three, that A depends on nothing because R1 has seen no other command at this point, right? So the ordering constraints uh, for, for A uh, you know, are the void set. R2 and R3 agree because they also haven't seen any other command at this point. And because these two acceptors agree with each other, R1 can commit locally and then notify everyone else asynchronously including the, cl the client. And let's assume that at about the same time, command B is proposed at replica five. Now, R5 doesn't know anything about A at this point, it hasn't received any message for A, so it says that B depends on nothing, and R4 agrees, but of course R3 has seen a pre-accept for A before seeing a pre-accept for B, so it says B has to depend on A. Now, because the two acceptors disagree with each other, R5 has to take the union of, this con of these uh, ordering dependencies and then tell everyone, this is the final uh, set of constraints for B. B has to depend on A. Uh, it, it does this through an accept message. Now, even if there were other concurrent commands at this point, accept messages or the uh, dependencies in accept messages, they do not have to be updated anymore. So it takes at most two round trips to uh, commit a command in ePaxos. Accept messages are just acknowledged. When a majority has acknowledged, the uh, command leader, R5, can commit B and then notify everyone else asynchronously. And one last example, let's say that C is proposed at R1. C has to depend on A, says R1, because it, it only knows about A at this point. But of course, R2 and R3 have both seen commits for B, and they say C depends on both A and B. Because the two agreed with each other, the two acceptors, um, R1 can commit locally and then notify everyone else asynchronously. So a simple analysis of this protocol would show you that it takes one round trip to commit commands when uh, commands are non-concurrent, but for some commands that are concurrent, it may take up to two rounds to commit. And uh, that's, not, that's not ideal. We, we wanted to avoid having to, to, to undergo two rounds to commit. So to our rescue comes this observation made before us by generalized Paxos and before generalized Paxos by generic broadcast protocols, which is that we don't actually have to order every command with respect to every other command consistently. We only have to order those commands that refer to the same state. So for example, imagine that we have a replicated key value store. We have two puts to different keys. We don't have to execute them in the same order on every replica, as long as we execute them both. So what this means for our protocol is that it'll take one round chip to commit those commands that are non-concurrent, or they are concurrent but non-interfering, and it'll take at most two rounds to uh, commit those commands or some of those commands that are both concurrent and interfering. And it turns out that in practice, it's really the case that commands are both concurrent and interfering. So mostly with e we will be able to commit commands after just one round trip. But the next logical question is how do we know that two commands interfere before executing them? Because remember, we first have to determine interference to be able to uh, order them. And then only after we've ordered them can we execute them. So the, the answer to this question is application specific. For no SQL systems, which are 
variants of key value stores, it is quite, quite easy. We just look at the operation key. If for two operations the key is the same, then they interfere. Otherwise, they do not. Or we can take the approach taken by Google App Engine, which requires application developers to specify a transaction key. And only those transactions that have the same key are guaranteed to be ordered consistently uh, across all replicas. And finally, it's easy, or it's, it's feasible, rather, to automatically infer uh, interference, even for more complex databases, like relational databases. Because it turns out that most of LTP workloads have these simple transactions that we can analyze beforehand, and we can tell for, sur for sure uh, which table and which row in which table they will touch. And so for these most uh, frequent simple transactions, it is very easy to determine whether they can interfere or not. And for the remaining few transactions that, that are complex and we cannot tell for, for certain what uh, data they will touch, it is safe to uh, just assume that they interfere with everything else. Question. Yes. Also uh, commutative operations, say, on the on a single bit of state, like incrementing a counter uh, by two different increments which would commute? Absolutely. So the more general definition is that we allow commutative operations to be committed in any order. That's right. And of course, uh, what I said, which was that we allow non-interfering or, or commands that refer to different uh, parts of the state to, to, um, to uh, be committed in any order, is subsumed by, by uh, commutativity. It's true. So we've established these ordering, these ordering constraints. How exactly do we, do we uh, parse the graph and, and execute these commands? So this is an example. Let's say we have five commands, A, B, C, D, E. And the edges here uh, represent ordering constraints. And this is how uh, a set of ordering constraints might look like. Now, this is a directed graph. Uh, it's not necessarily acyclic. So what we do is we find the strongly connected components. And then this graph, where strongly connected components are super nodes, uh, this is a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. So we can sort it topologically. And then in inverse topological order, we can execute the strongly connected components. For a component that has more than one command, we execute those commands in increasing order of their approximate sequence number. This is a, an extra ordering constraint that I haven't described, but a simple way to think about it is it's essentially a Lamport clock. So what this gets us is <laughs> uh, uh, this, I thought that these, the whole point was that you were establishing a total order. So where did this loop come from? Uh, but doesn't that mean your protocol failed? Right. So when we, when we establish these ordering constraints, we can get cycles. Oh, that's right? bad. Uh, that's bad. So the way we solve cycles is we have these extra ordering constraints, which are much simpler. They are just a Lamport clock, right? So there is there's, uh, there's essentially uh, a counter that's updated in a certain way for every command. And then inside strongly connected components, which means inside cycles, we execute those commands in increasing order of that Lamport clock. But if you do that for strongly, so why do you do that for everything and throw all of this away? Just use the Lamport clock. That's a good level. question. That's a good question. So we can get into a situation where, um, I guess the simplest answer, the simplest way to put that is that the, uh, the, uh, the space, the domain for this Lamport clock, doesn't have to be completely covered. So we can have a single number of five for a command, but that does not mean that we have commands that have sequence numbers one through four. So we may, we may wait forever for something to have sequence number four. So that's why we need the uh, uh, first type of ordering constraints, these edges in the graph. But an edge, an edge, edge doesn't mean that A precedes C, say. It, it could be something different because then a cycle wouldn't exactly. work. Exactly. If there's a cycle, right. So if in, in most cases, a directed edge does mean that um, uh, the, uh, the command that the arrow points to is going to be first. In some cases, that will not be the case. And that's, those are the cases where commands are being proposed um, uh, concurrently. And messages for some commands arrive with some replicas first. And for other commands that are uh, messages for, uh, sorry, for other replicas, there are messages for other commands that arrive first. That's how we get cycles. And we have to solve them. And the way we solve them is we use this, this simple Lamport clock. So the property that makes the Lamport clock work is that you know that there's going to be no new members of this cycle. No new members of this song that to are going to arrive later. Exactly, if the command has been committed. So if the command has been committed, we are certain that a majority of replicas have the um, um, sorry, the, the, the last version 
of the Lamper clock that's ever going to be updated for that command. Right? And th what that gives us is this nice property called linearizability. So linearizability is a strong consistency property in distributed systems. Um, it subsumes serializability. And furthermore, it says that if two commands interfere, two commands A and B interfere, and one of them is committed at some replica before the other one is even proposed at any replica, then the, one, the, the first one will be executed consistently first at every replica in the system. Another nice property of Epaxos is, the, is that fast path quorums, and by fast path quorums I mean what is the subset of acceptors, including the command leader, that have to agree on the initial set of ordering constraints for that command to be committed on the fast path. So the size of fast path quorums is f plus seal of f over 2, where f is the maximum number of concurrent tolerated failures. Now what this means is that we are optimal for the most common deployments of Paxos, which are 3 and 5 replicas respectively, and we are better than previous versions of optimized for low latency, which are fast and generalized Paxos, by exactly one replica. Now what this means in a practice is that if we do geo-replication with a setup like this, where we have a replica in Japan, two on the US West Coast, one on the US East Coast, and one in Europe, the replica in Japan can commit a command after just talking to its close, two closest neighbors. It doesn't have to go all the way to Europe or all the way to the East Coast as these protocols would have, would have to. So we've implemented Epaxos uh, along with the other uh, Paxos variants, and we uh, tested it on Amazon EC2. The, the workload that we used was a, a replicated key value store. This is wide area, a wide area setup. It's the same setup that I described earlier. We have a replica in North Virginia, one in North California, one in Oregon, Ireland, and Japan. And this is to give you a sense of the round trips uh, between those sites. And so we had clients at every location proposing commands and measuring how long it takes for the command to be committed. In this diagram, I'm going to show the median latency experienced by clients at every uh, one of these sites for every one of these protocols, Epaxos, Mencius, Generalized Paxos, and multi -paxos. So for a client of Epaxos, the latency that it will experience, it'll be that of its uh, co-located replica to go to its two closest neighbors, which are Oregon and Virginia. And that's the same for a client of multi -paxos, but only because the multi -paxos client is in California. For a client in Virginia, however, it first has to go to the uh, stable leader of multi -paxos in California, wait for that command to be committed, and then uh, wait for the leader to get back to, uh, to it. So the latency is going to be higher. Mencius has to wait for some information from every replica in the system, including the replicas that are furthest away, so it has higher latency. And uh, generalized Paxos has larger fast path quorums, so it has higher latency than Epaxos. And at every location, Epaxos has the lowest latency of all the protocols, and the reason is Epaxos is optimal, has optimal commit latency in the wide area for three and five replicas. Now, of course, this refers to the situation when concurrent commands do not interfere, or for, for those commands that, that do not interfere with the other concurrent commands. When interference does occur uh, for concurrent commands, then some of them will incur latency that's double uh, this. However, um, we believe that that's rare enough that it affects only tail latency, 99% tail latency. And also, there are ways to mitigate that latency uh, that we, we haven't implemented yet, but are pretty straightforward. And Epaxos also uh, helps in, the, uh, local, in a local area cluster. Uh, this is a comparison uh, of the throughput achieved with multi paxos Mencius, and Epaxos for various rates of command interference. 0% means that no concurrent commands interfere. 100% means that all commands interfere. And what you can see here is that Epaxos has higher throughput than the previous protocols when interference is low. Furthermore, when replicas are slow, in this case, one replica was slow. For multi paxos it had to be the, uh, the leader. Otherwise, the, the throughput of multi paxos would not have decreased significantly. But so when the multi paxos leader is slow, or any replica in Mencius or Epaxos is slow, uh, the uh, performance of Epaxos degrades more gracefully than for the other protocols. And the reason is we have the flexibility to simply avoid replicas that are slow. And uh, you might wonder what happens with batching, because in multi paxos where we have a single leader, getting all the commands, there's a higher opportunity for batching. It can just take all those commands and commit it in one batch. Now, 
this is a latency versus throughput graph. Um, the uh, y scale is, uh, so the, the y axis is log scale. Uh, in this graph, it's better to be lower because that means lower latency and more to the uh, right because that means higher throughput. This is the, uh, the curve for uh, multi-paxos. Uh, this is the curve for e-paxos. This paxos has much better throughput, about three times the throughput at about 10 times lower uh, latency because the um, uh, load of communicating with clients, with all the clients that propose commands, is spread across all the replicas in the system instead of falling squarely on the shoulders of the uh, single liter uh, multi-paxos uh, replica. And this is epaxos 0% interference. epaxos 100% interference is essentially about the same. And the reason is the cost of the second round uh, of communication is uh, amortized across the many commands in one batch. Second round messages only have to update dependencies. They don't have to uh, send the commands again, right? So they are very small messages. And finally, the, yes? The batch window determines the trade off between the throughput and the latency, right? Exactly. So how would those graphs change if you change the batching window size? Does it have any effect? Uh, yeah, so it's a good question. So the way we did it, this minimum latency would increase. But Miguel would point out that that's not necessarily the case. So there is, there is, a, there is a nice straightforward way to, to implement batching so that this minimum latency doesn't increase uh, no matter what the, uh, the, the, the batching window size you choose. You just simply send the commands that you have at a certain point. You, just, you don't wait for the batching window to expire. Um, but it will also mean that uh, tail throughput might increase a little bit. Now, the, uh, the batching window that it, we used, 5 milliseconds, was large enough that it wouldn't increase too much here, uh, at least not in our setup. So a nice side benefit of VPAX is that it has constant availability. And to show you this, I'm going to show you uh, a sequence of throughput over time uh, graphs. This is for multi-paxos. And it has stable throughput until the leader fails. This only happens if the leader fails. If a non-leader replica fails, uh, throughput essentially remains the same. But if the leader fails, the throughput will temporarily go to zero before a new leader is elected. Uh, and that's the same for Mencius, but here any replica failing will cause this, uh, this behavior. With epaxos, however, the throughput never goes to zero. It does decrease here. Uh, these are, this is a setup with three replicas. It decreases by about a third because the clients that were talking to that replica that failed have to time out before talking to a different replica. So throughput decreases temporarily. So what is it that triggers the election of a new leader? Uh, the failure of uh, the old leader. So I'm going to try now to disentangle some of the main insights into Paxos. Why, why does it work? Um, or why does it work better than previous state machine verification protocols? And the main insight is that we deal with ordering explicitly. Instead of having uh, instead of dealing with ordering implicitly by just committing commands in this pre-ordered sequence of slots, we take ordering, we put it into our protocol. And this allows us to get higher throughput because all replicas are command leaders at the same time. It gives us better performance stability because we have the flexibility to avoid replicas that are either slow or far away. And low latency because in geo replication scenarios, we can just talk to replicas that are uh, closest to us. Yes? It seems that it is uh, non-waiting, the fact that you can just commit into your own slot that, that gives you the high throughput. I wonder, <laughs> is it clear why you need to do all this um, uh, ordering? Couldn't you just, probably not, but couldn't you just uh, define a, a canonical ordering on this table that you have? Yeah, and that would give you Mencius, which was the previous protocol uh, that, I, that we've compared against. So with Mencius, the problem if you have a pre-established order is that you depend on uh, replicas that own the previous slots for, for you to be able to commit. You have a full table that you can mm -hmm. commit into. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't have to wait for owners of previous slots. The difference between having a bidimensional array where we have a pre-established order between, between cells and having a, a, a unidimensional array, uh, I, I believe there's no difference between those, uh, those two variants. It's just a different diagram, but it's the same logical thing. Yes? So your low latency results are impressive, but it seems that you're improving the average latency while giving up a little bit of the tail latency. 
That's true. contrast, if you look at mainstream networking literature, mm -hmm. it's all about the latency. As if people have been sh showing that they are willing to give up on average latency to improve the tail. Because on average, things are pretty well, work well most of the time. So right, so we haven't shown these, uh, these, I haven't shown these results in the talk. We have them in the uh, SOSP paper. Um, we, do in, we do improve tail latency. Uh, and we, we can improve it even more with techniques that we do describe in the paper, but we haven't implemented in the paper. So they do not reflect in the, uh, the results. But your tail will be worse if there are interfering commands, right? It will be worse than uh, some of the protocols. It will be uh, better than, for example, generalized Paxos. It might be worse than, than Mencius or Marl-like Paxos. But it depends on it depends on the uh, on the exact setup. So have you looked at any data sets where how many fraction of commands are interfering? Yeah, so um, uh, that's a good question. We looked at the yeah, workloads described in the literature, like for example, Spanner, Chubby, and uh, we concluded based on based on their description of the workloads that command interference is actually very low. It's it's under it's under one percent. So. Uh, ordering commands explicitly, that gives us these nice benefits. Furthermore, it allows us to only optimize those delays that matter, because previous uh, Paxos protocols that optimize for uh, low latency, like fast Paxos and generalized Paxos, they try to do away with the first message delay, that between the client and the first replica. But, of course, in uh, uh, geo-replication scenarios, replicas are usually co-located with, with uh, sorry, clients are usually co-located with their closest replicas. So that first message delay does not matter. Instead, we optimize for smaller quorums, which help us with uh, low latency. And I will point out that we have a formal proof of correctness for EPAXOS. We also have a uh, TLA plus specification that's model checkable. Uh, and we uh, release the uh, implementation of EPAXOS and all the other protocols uh, open source. So at the beginning of the talk, I was I was, uh, I was uh, describing how um, I plan to improve state machine replication. Uh, I believe that uh, ePaxos goes some way into achieving that. Uh, it has higher throughput, uh, optimally low, wide area latency. It has better performance robustness than previous protocols, and also uh, constant availability. As, and there's a nice side effect. We don't have to do leader election because there's no leader. Um, but can we improve other important aspects of state machine replication? And Every so every, uh, so you, you're gonna there are multiple dimensions to yeah well there are multiple dimensions to what it means to have a good state machine repli uh, or a good replicated state machine now these are some of the obvious performance characteristics throughput latency performance robustness but there are, there are others so are you less good than others you are not telling us about well um, just better on every dimension we are better on the ones that we've considered so far okay. and are you worse on any we are, for example, uh, as Sintesh was pointing out, uh, we sometimes trade off uh, tail latency for median latency. And of course, ePaxos is more complex. It takes uh, you know, more work to understand it and implement it correctly. It takes more work to, to, to prove that an implementation is correct. So there's that problem. And of course, um, you also have to understand uh, semantics about the workload to, to be able to assess command interference. So one other important aspect of, of replicated state machine is orthogonal to the, the, uh, the, uh, the things that uh, ePaxos addresses uh, is read performance. How do we read very quickly from a replicated state machine? And uh, I'm going to show you why reads are different from normal commands. So of course, what we can do with a read is we can just simply treat it as, a, as any other command. So we have a client. And now we have a, a multi-paxo system. And the client tries to read from a replica. That replica will forward the command to the leader, the read command. The leader will simply commit it, just as it would with any other command. It would then execute it and send it back to the client, perhaps through uh, the replica that initially got the, uh, the message, right? Because maybe that's the closest replica to the client. Uh, this involves a lot of communication, so it's not going to be super efficient. A better way to do it is to have the client sends the command to uh, any replica. That replica talks to any quorum of, com uh, any quorum of replicas, maybe uh, the, uh, the closest replicas. Uh, they wait for the ongoing commands to be committed and executed, and then they return the uh, result. And uh, the client will take just the uh, uh, result 
that uh, belongs to the most advanced log of, uh, of uh, update uh, commands. This is better. It's less communication than when we treat reads as just any other command. It does, however, involve some communication, so it's not perfect. Now, practical systems use variants of time leases. The most common time lease is a leader lease. Here, the leader has a time lease for every object in the system. The client, that means that if the leader fails, the new leader is not able to update any uh, state until the leader until the uh, the lease of the old leader has expired and that gives the old leader the guarantee that as long as the lease is active it can safely read the freshest version of every object in the system right so clients can now simply talk to that uh, stable leader uh, it'll read from its local store and just get back the result this is great for those clients that are co-located with the leader it's not great for clients that are not co-located with the leader perhaps in other data centers it does make a leader hotspot. So the, the uh, discussion uh, in the second part of the talk applies to any variant of Paxos, not just ePaxos, right? It applies to multi-Paxos, ePaxos, general Paxos, and so on. In ePaxos, you wouldn't have a leader, but if you were to implement this single leader, sorry, single replica lease, you would have the same problem with reads. You would be able to commit writes everywhere, but you wouldn't be able to, uh, to uh, read uh, except for at one location, one replica. Another approach is taken by Google's megastore system. Instead of giving the lease to one replica, it gives the lease to every replica in the system. And now this has great, write, uh, great read performance because a read can be serviced locally everywhere. However, we pay the price for this better read performance when we do writes because now writes have to synchronously reach every single replica in the system. That means that writes have higher latency than uh, if we didn't have the, this megastore lease. And it also means that the system is going to be temporarily unavailable for writes uh, whenever any replica in the system becomes unavailable. So this is the price that we pay here. Now, if we were to look at the uh, design space for time leases, uh, we would see that previous solutions essentially uh, are these two points. There's the leader lease, which has almost as good a write performance as when we don't use leases at all, but its read performance is far from ideal. And then we have megastore leases, which have great read performance, but they pay the price with a poor write performance. In our work, we try to explore the space in between. And the way we do that is through uh, something that we call quorum leases. And quorum leases allow us to arbitrarily uh, move along this space. And furthermore, more, I will argue that quorum leases give us most of the benefits of the two previous uh, design points. And the idea is actually very simple. Instead of giving the lease to one replica or all the replicas, we give the lease to any subset of the replicas. And we make the observation that the quorum communication necessary for committing updates in Paxos induces a natural leasing strategy. And that is, we uh, might be at a, at a sweet spot if we give the lease to those replicas in a quorum. So if we have to synchronously update replicas in a quorum before we commit, an, uh, before we commit a, uh, a write, we might as well give those replicas the ability to reload. You say the lease. Is there just one lease in the system? That's a great question. Or is there something like this is a key value store embedded in, as an assumption here? No, so there's, no, there's not a single lease. This doesn't have to be a single lease. We can have multiple leases for uh, overlapping quorums. And these leases... These leases would refer to different objects. If we have a replicated key value store, a lease might refer to a subset of the keys. Another lease held by a different quorum will refer to a disjoint subset of the keys. And the assumption that would make this work well is that different objects are hot at different replicas. So imagine a replicated uh, social networking graph. Clients or a data center in Europe would likely see more uh, demand for those objects that pertain to users in Europe, whereas data centers in the US would likely see more commands for those objects that pertain to users in the US. So that's why we believe this assumption is realistic. Now, instead of laying out our design, I'm just going to present the challenges with implementing these quorum leases, and I'll be happy to talk about them if you uh, want to ask me about them. Uh, the, the most important question is which 
core room should hold a lease for each object. And uh, it quickly became apparent that core room leases should be dynamic. When we had leader leases or all replicas have the lease, uh, that was a static assignment. It was very easy to, to say who holds the lease for what, right? The single leader lease holds the lease for everything or every replica holds the lease for everything. Here, however, uh, we should adapt to access patterns. There's no point holding a lease at a replica that will never uh, try to read a command, uh, sorry, uh, an object. And we need to do this. We need to establish, maintain, and update leases. We need to be able to migrate objects from different quorums. For many objects, millions of objects, maybe mil many millions of objects simultaneously with minimal bandwidth overhead. And we have to do all this while maintaining the uh, safety and, and strong consistency guarantees of, of both uh, the underlying Paxos algorithm and maintain strong consistency guarantees for our reads. And um, the results that we have so far for, for our implementation of core releases are encouraging. Uh, we use the YCSB benchmark with a skewed workload. That is, uh, the workload distribution is, uh, uses the Zipfian distribution. Um, and for wide area, the same setup that I've shown you earlier, we get 60 to 90% of all reads at every location are local and a similar percentage of writes have the minimum latency that can be achieved in the system. Uh, with a bit of engineering, I'm pretty sure that we can get this number to more than 90% for skewed workloads. And leases are also better in the, in the local area. Uh, compared to single layer leases, they give us um, a 4.6x higher throughput on five replicas. This is not quite as good as megastore leases. It's about 20% lower than megastore leases, but it also uh, with core releases, we also don't pay the, uh, the price that Megastore releases uh, uh, force us to pay, which is uh, lower write availability and uh, slightly increased uh, latency. So in summary, um, I've described ways to improve state machine replication, and they included optimally low latency in the wide area, higher throughput, and higher performance stability, and all these were due to uh, a new state machine replication protocol we call it egalitarian Paxos. Uh, I also described how we can get <laughs> high read performance without sacrificing write performance, and this was due to core releases. And I believe that there's uh, extensive room in this space for our future work. Uh, I want to explore reconfiguration protocols that do not reduce the availability of the system and also do not impose high overheads on throughput. I would also like to explore further uses of wall clock time beyond leases. So what happens if, for instance, we have synchronous clocks? Uh, we get better implementations of UPAXs, and we believe we can. Or conversely, what happens if we don't have synchronous clocks, but we want to get um, consistency guarantees similar to systems that do have synchronous clocks, like Spanner? We want to get, for example, snapshot reads. Can we do so with only quorum leases? And again, I believe there, there might be ways that we can do that. And finally, I think it will be interesting to put this all together and have uh, general transactions spanning multiple ePaxos groups uh, and increase uh, the uh, read-only transaction performance with quorum leases. So in the last slide of this talk, I'm going to point out that I've also worked on other projects be, uh, uh, beyond uh, state machine replication. I've worked on practical data structures, algorithms, uh, and also on redesigning systems around upcoming non-volatile memory technologies. And if your interests align with these, uh, please ask me about them. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So you, you, um, e Epactor sounds wonderful, right? And, and, and as you described it, it's, uh, it applies to high value systems that, you know, in big data centers and so small wins generate large amounts of dollars. So is everybody abandoning their current implementations and busily writing impact source implementations? Is it, if you had a sort of real world impact, it sounds well, so that's, applicable. That is our hope, but uh, obviously it's not going to be uh, that easy. First of all, um, as I said, EPAX is a more com complex protocol. It takes longer to understand it and implement it. Uh, there are uh, efforts currently to, to implement EPAXOS in, in, in various places. Um, we, we, we just hope that it's going to go well. But it doesn't mean a big application yet. 
Um, right, as far as I know, no. So what's this all, uh, I'm not an expert, non-Byzantine, is that how you say it? Right, non-Byzantine or sometimes called uh, benign right. failures. Is it all non-Byzantine? Absolutely, right? yes. So how relevant is the Byzantine case um, for real-world systems? <coughs> and do you have ways of addressing that? Um, to be honest, I, I, I'm not sure how, how relevant it is for real-world uh, systems. I, 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 I see that uh, many of these um, big internet companies, they uh, settle for uh, non-Byzantine failures. For, for tolerating non-Byzantine failures, and that's why I, that's what I address in my work. I think it could become uh, important. Um, I think it's a valid area of research. Um, it's not it's not very widely applied, as far as I know. Well, I have a couple of comments. Um, so, so first, I I didn't think that the comparison with um, things like. Uh, Mesh's and, mm. and multiplexes are fair because they don't really rely on on dependencies of uh, of finding dependencies across operations. Which, if you go to the key value store example, uh, that might be trivial, but I find that a bit naive. If you pick if you pick applications like Zookeeper or applications of Zookeeper, um, they use they use uh, Z nodes in in very complex ways, and the dependencies are not always clear. And so. So it sounds like you're trading off performance um, uh, with uh, the difficulty or, or pass, giving the, uh, um, um, uh, making the role of the developer be more complex with respect to... I agree with that. I agree with that completely, yes. So, that is true. Because you said everything would depend on everything else, how bad would it be? Everything would be... So, not everything, but most commands would have to undergo two round trips to commit. Two uh, round trips. Two round trips to commit. Square one. Not, not, not exactly. So um, in the graph that I showed you with uh, with batching, the performance of VPAX was even when all commands interfered, was was about the same as when no commands interfered, uh, and that is because we simply do a better job of distributing the load uh, across all replicas. Even if we do have to undergo the second round of communication, those messages in the second round are so small that for throughput they essentially don't matter. So that's your answer. They feel no, but 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 Flavio is right in that if you if you really cannot uh, differentiate between uh, different commands and you cannot tell whether two commands interfere, then there would essentially be no point in applying this, for example, in the wide area because you, you probably won't get that many uh, latency savings unless you have um, very few commands being concurrent. So so yes, you, you do have to have more applica application specific knowledge, absolutely. If you don't, then probably you're better off, uh, you know, using Mencius or multi-paxos. The other question I have was about recovery. So when you when you mentioned that a leader fail and you have all the protocols that are that are not leaderless, mm. um, um, that the leader fails and you have to recover, it's not only about electing a new leader, right? Mm -hmm. When a server cr uh, process crashes and, and recovers, you need to restore the state of that server. When you have a leader, it's it's logically simpler because you can just pull the state mm -hmm. of the leader. But in your case, could you? Yeah. So I think I, I think when I talk about this, I qualified it as you know, as long as a minority of replicas fail, then we have constant availability. Obviously, if we have more, if we have majority of replicas failure failing, then uh, you know the protocol is not going to be live anymore by definition. Um, and 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 indeed, when we bring new replicas into the system there is going to be a challenge to, to do so uh, without impacting throughput very much, right? Because we have to update this, the state of, of uh, the reserve replicas. And there are ways to do it that have been explored in the literature that we can do checkpointing, you know, bulk data transfer, uh, and they apply to EPAXs as well. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right, let's thank the speaker again.